Dan will be here in 10 minutes. Who? You. <laughs> he's going to walk in the door. Everyone stand up like he's God with your book and just applaud like you've read the book. It's your favorite book. You've come to get it signed. Everyone gets a book. Uh, everyone gets a book. Yay! 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 Hi, I'm Chris. It is so great to uh, meet you in person. Big fan. Will you come with me? Everybody is super excited. Now, I just got to warn you, they're they're ready to get going. So as soon as we walk in, it's just going to start. And your function is? I'm just sort of here. I'm just going to like sort of facilitate and just sort of like, you know, anything you need. But I think it'll be pretty um, easy. Obviously, the crowd is super excited. And um, the crowd? Are you ready? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, it's a good crowd. OK. All right. Great. Here we go. to 2012. Uh, I've known Dan for uh, more of my life than not. Uh, he grew up in Wisconsin. Uh, he started with uh, the Dead Ale Lives. Let's hear for the Dead Ale Lives. Yeah! Mm -hmm. uh, and a comic book uh, created by Rob Schraub called Scud the Disposable Assassin. Uh, uh, that Rob, Rob and Dan they, I guess they want you to stand up for this. Jesus. <laughs> yeah, uh, that script uh, brought them out here, and since then, uh, of course, they've written Monster House. Uh, he's created Community. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Monster House. Monster House. <laughs> Big Ant Movie. Let's hear it for Big Ant Movie. Yeah. Uh, a couple pilots this year for Fox and CBS. Uh, and tonight, uh, to celebrate uh, the man, he's 40 years old today. Woo! Uh, as his brain slowly melts, we are going to be doing some readings from his new book. Uh, so to start up tonight, uh, please welcome up first uh, the author of the foreword to the book, Mr. Dino Stamatopoulos. Yeah. I'm not even dressed as anything. <laughs> Why, you ask, would Dan even be friends with such an envious, self-serving creature? I guess it's because I'm honest, and so is Dan, brutally honest. And you'll find out when you voraciously devour these next several pages. And the person he's most brutally honest with is himself. And so the job of absorbing Dan Harmon's complete web literature is relegated to you, Dan's fans and acquaintances, happy devouring. Without question, you have a multitude of musings and self-doubt and extreme narcissism and beautiful observations and ugly occurrences and toilets and testicles <laughs> and mind-blowing dissections of the human psyche ahead of you. And by God, you're lucky for that. Luckier than me anyway, because you get to actually read it. This <laughs> book. <laughs> was conceived, curated, edited, and published without Dan Harmon's knowledge. Surprise, Dan! <laughs> <laughs> I first fell in love with Dan while reading his blogs. Sitting on the floor of my tiny apartment, I opened his MySpace blog the morning after Dan stored, stormed out of the bar because he couldn't handle us just being friends. My friend was working for him, and I thought da us dating would be inappropriate, blah, blah, blah. I started reading the blog and couldn't stop for hours. Dan's humanity grabbed me by the heart and didn't let go until I was at his mercy. 
Frankie would still have me, or at least write about how he jerked off to the thought of me blowing his high school bullet. <laughs> since that day, since that day, we haven't spent more than 30 hours apart. Every hour I spend with him, I spend as my truest, most flawed self, and I cannot be happier or more in love. Take that, everybody else. <laughs> if you let it, this book has the potential to make you a more honest friend, writer, lover, and human being. It's heartbreaking, hilarious, disgusting, beautiful, infuriating, inspiring, instructional, upsetting, and the most beautiful collection of contemporary writing I've ever had the pleasure of pouring through. I love this book. I love Dan. Erin McGathy, Girlfriend, 2011 to... <laughs> <laughs> this is called, I, I'm So Fucking Hot. <laughs> Uh, it's from August 14th, 2005. <laughs> oh my God. Dude, I'm so fucking hot and awesome. Whenever I walk into a bar, everyone sees me in slow motion. All the women want to stick their hands down my shirt and run their fingers through my ursine coat. <laughs> and I have to grab their wrist and say, take it easy, sugar. We've got all night for that stuff. <laughs> and then I just blow their minds with my knowledge of story structure. <laughs> Until an appropriate song comes on the jukebox, at which point I leap to my feet and start shaking my ass. And I shake my ass so hard that quarters start flying out of it. And everyone starts cheering and picking them up. But I shout out, take it easy, sugars. There's no such thing as property. And they're all like, holy fuck, he's so hot and smart and socialist. And they drop the quarters and we all start dancing together like in that Love is a Battlefield video. <laughs> looking at the camera and shaking our shoulders. And I lead everyone outside into the street. And we're all dancing. And cars are screeching to a stop. And people are honking. But then my followers pull them out and they start dancing too. And everyone in the city starts dancing. And old ladies are throwing away their walkers. And black teenagers are dropping their handguns. And doing the robot like black teenagers should. <laughs> and the entire city of Los Angeles follows me across America. And everybody in every city we go through starts following us, snapping and dancing. And when we get to the Mississippi River, <laughs> the people form a human bridge by grabbing themselves and letting the others walk across their backs. <laughs> And the government realizes we're headed for DC. <laughs> so they deploy tanks, but our bodies just gum up their treads, and the soldiers get pulled out, and they start dance marching with us toward the White House. And the Secret Service tries to shoot us all, but they can't, and we just dance into the Oval Office and everyone locks hands in a tunnel and I come dancing in and the president is like, what is the meaning of this? And I'm like, what is the meaning of this? And I start peeing all over the president. And he's like, ah, ah, you're peeing on me. And I'm going, yeah, because you're human and you're accountable to humanity and this is what the insides of a human being feels like. <laughs> It's hot liquid, it's visceral, it's life, it's God, and you've forgotten all that. <laughs> so now you get peed on. <laughs> and then I say, get him up. <laughs> and two of the black teenagers that were previously redeemed lift the president to his feet. And I say, this is for not protecting the people that pay your salary. This is for hurting the people stupid enough to trust you. This is for taking advantage just because you can. This is for telling people they should sit in a cubicle in a black tower, letting them think that doing that would eventually pay off, and then just letting some fucking assholes that you pissed off fly airplanes through their families, through their Gilbert cartoons and bobbleheads, and wake me for the weekend coffee cups while you sit in a bulletproof bubble paid for with their unpaid labor. This is for lying to yourself, 
to them, to everyone. This is what happens to liars. And I fake like I'm gonna punch him. And he cringes. <laughs> but then I just kiss him on his piss soaked cheek and walk away back through the tunnel of humanity and it closes behind me and absorbs me. And the president just falls to his knees and starts crying. And he says, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. I've done such a horrible thing. I've been so bad. It's the power. It changes you before you even get it. It demands things of you. There's no such thing as doing a little bad to get into a position where you can do a lot of good. If you have to do bad to get into a position, then it's a bad position. And when you get into it, the devil is going to be on your call sheet. And he's going to have a list of things for you to do. And it never stops. You just get more and more evil. And I'm sorry that I was born rich. I'm so sorry. Someone forgive me. And all the laws and all the money just turn to dust. Because humanity has advanced. And we don't live in that world anymore. Everyone just acquires this innate and universal sense of priority. <laughs> Everyone understands that people should just be good to each other. Right? The next 5,000 years are spent in peace. And they put my face on a stamp. <laughs> <laughs> That's how fucking hot and awesome I am. Hi, everybody. My name is Yvette Nicole Brown. And I, oh, that's nice. And I will be reading How to Vaporize People. This was written August 15th, 2005. If you think about it, other people only actually exist in your mind. And the interactions you're having with them are not actual interactions between you and another person. They're interactions you've been having between yourself and your perception of some other person. Some person who is probably just symbolic of something for you through no fault of their own. They're not real. I mean, there is a real person out there with that name, but you don't really know them. You're just using some paper doll likeness of them that you generated to torture yourself. Like the guy that picked on you in high school, or the guy in the back of the room that wasn't laughing during your act, or your parents, or the girl that doesn't like you as much as you like her, or the people on the phone that want to know when you're going to pay them, or the storyboard artist, artist that was the funny guy before you got hired. These people, oh, there's a story. These people <laughs> would be just as happy as you would be if you would just vaporize their paper doll. In other words, vaporize the them that you know. And here's how. Sit in a chair, close your eyes, breathe in through your nose, out through your mouth. As you exhale, let go of every muscle in your body, starting with your feet, and moving upward until you can't even feel your own body. If this is one of those extreme cases, one of those people that makes your stomach feel uneasy, you probably can still feel the stomach thing. But here's the trick. Pretend it's good. Just pretend for a second. Imagine a world where that uneasy feeling in your stomach was some kind of a highly sought thing. Once you commit to the scenario, you will automatically endow the feeling as a fleeting one because all good things go away. Each time you exhale, a little more dizzy stomach goes out into the world, like the CG files in, spoiler, the Green Mile, spoiler's over. <laughs> take as much time as you need to take until all the dizzy stomach stuff is gone, and your whole body is equalized, and your identity is no longer localized to your head or your body. You're now just a vague, tingly location on some very vague map of the cosmos. Now. Imagine a photograph of the person that is making your stomach hurt. Now, vaporize that photo. Turn it into a zillion little particles and exhale those. Take a couple more breaths until you've exhaled all of them. They're gone forever. Open your eyes. You're fine. No more stomach. Everything's back to normal. You don't even remember their name. Next time you'll see them, you'll be meeting them for the first time. It's lovely. <laughs> Declaration of Independence from Humanity, <laughs> September 10th, 2005. Unquenched by meat, booze, and pussy. <laughs> We 
with no fear to subdue it, no agenda to divert it. A fire climbs the walls of my stomach, engulfing my heart, pumping boiling plasma to a waking brain. At 11, my brain woke up like this in the back of my parents' car. I announced to my family that they didn't have to keep going through these motions. I knew that they were robots, puppets, characters, that I was the only person in the world. I knew that when I talked to them, I was actually addressing God, who was only toying with me. My mom got upset. Was she crying? My brother stared at the floor. My father shouted, finally, commanded me to stop it. Holy fuck, I thought. I'd only said it so they'd prove it wrong. I'm more right than I wanted to be. <laughs> After a year among the robots, there was relief. <laughs> my first kiss, truth or dare, Susie Shamit, the girl that held my sweaty hand and the Goonies. How could a robot ever make you feel like that? What's so bad about this place anyway? There's a chemical release that only a girl can trigger, some beautiful venom that rides the boiling blood straight to the brain, numbs it. <laughs> the lights dim and flicker like stars, the whining cogs slow until they sound like crickets. Everything turns into summer. That's why God imagines this world for me. That is the miracle. I can forget that I know. <laughs> <laughs> then over time, they drop hints that they're not real. They say things that aren't true. They throw little sparks, repeat themselves. There's a cylinder inside them with a pattern of bumps that make music. You're keeping them alive by winding them. It's like kissing a puppet with your hand in it. The lips feel cold. They know you know. The fourth wall flickers, and there's God laughing and pointing. Ha ha! You tried to fuck a mannequin. <laughs> <laughs> Twenty years later, I'm knowing something similar but new. You guys aren't robots. I can't look at everyone in the world and say they're not real. All seven billion of you? <laughs> what are the odds? <laughs> it's me. You guys are the people. I'm the other thing. Jesus? Mm -hmm. Frankenstein? Satan? What do they all have in common? No wife, no fireplace, no dog, no white picket fence. <clears throat> Not for more than a stolen moment. In the end, whether ascending to the sky, going back underground, or just floating away on an iceberg, things end up back where they belong, leaving the world to the people. You've always known. You've been telling me every day of my life from kindergarten to yesterday. It's me that's been deceptive to myself. I am a man made of goo. <laughs> from deep underground, <laughs> visiting your sunshine world. <laughs> I'm among you for moments, but never able to be with you. And when I try, it's embarrassing and inevitably hurtful. <laughs> and you all say, Dan, you should try being alone for a while. <laughs> it's like telling a snowman you should try being water. <laughs> restaurant's redhead bartender. Can I please marry the back of your head? <laughs> You're very beautiful from the front, but every time you turn around, I want to spend the rest of my life with you, probably because that's when I can stare at your perfect burgundy hair with impunity, unless you consider it punitory that my friends are making fun of me, which I do not. They're making fun of me because it's funny to them. And if they stopped laughing and pulled knives on, on me, I wouldn't stop looking at you, so it doesn't matter to me. It was my decision to share my fetish with the world, perhaps hoping to distribute, alleviate, and neutralize its shocking grip on my otherwise somewhat human mind. It didn't work. Maybe it made it worse. Maybe having celebrated my affliction, I feel permission upon seeing hair like yours to become a juvenile chimpanzee instead of <laughs> struggling for higher thought. Maybe if I had kept this thing a secret, my shame of it would have forced me to cure, have a cure by now. Men with Tourette's don't just throw up their hands and run through the street hoping others adapt. They burden themselves with the need for change. It hardly matters right now. 
As you would see if you were turned around, my face has a placid expression on it, a please stand by title card. That goes up automatically every time I see a woman whose hair color is anywhere between strawberry blonde and auburn. Because my frontal lobe shuts down in a shower of sparks, and all that remains is some lower animal. The closer the woman's hair gets to your particular shade, the closer I get to being what I am right now, which is essentially a moth, unable to navigate by anything other than your carmine colored tresses. There's nothing primal or romantic happening, just chemicals, cross wires, sickness. But I never want it to stop. I want to stare at you forever. If someone carried you away, I'd be disappointed, but I'd be alive again. If you stood in front of me forever, I would starve to death, but I don't care, because it's only in these brief moments that all of my scattered thoughts can be focused into a single coherent laser. It's like being plunged underwater but without having to worry about when I'll breathe again. When I see hair like yours, it no longer matters if I live or die. There's a longing to get closer to you, to touch you, smell you, hold you, but I'm older now, smarter now, more tired now. It would take days of strategy and small talk, <laughs> starting with your name, which becomes a smile, which becomes some random combination of politics, pop culture, and pet peeves. Lists of rules, flaming hoops, embellished eccentricities, embarrassing ambitions, desperate affections. You'd show me the giant hole where your identity should be. i show you mine. We'd shove them together and create a sad smuck. Then we'd stick to each other while the vacuum decayed over three weeks to 24 months. <laughs> <laughs> and after all we done, and we were both a little older and a little more scuffed after we had said goodbyes and yes, of course I'd love to work with you one of these days, after everything good that happened on the way in, had been undone by something bad on the way out. The only thing that would be left would be me wishing I could touch your hair. So don't turn around, German-themed restaurant redhead bartender. <laughs> because what we have right now is as good as it gets. I'm happy to see that your lips are naturally pink and that they match your tuberettes, which I suppose are there because your silken cardinal locks long to caress your porcelain face as much as I do. <laughs> but sooner or later, do a 180 and get back to the cash register or that beer tap so I can stop avoiding eye contact and just haunt you like a fat demon. <laughs> <laughs> Running my slime-coated lecherous gaze along the length of your lush, burnt, maroon hair as it cascades over your shoulders and terminates in a straight line of slightly frayed tips just above the delicate impression of your bra strap. And after your shift, <laughs> let's get married. Just me in the back of your head. Don't look at me while I promise to have and to hold you, to cherish and shampoo you, to be yours <laughs> for tangled or brushed and cute hats and ponytails for as long as you shall stay that color. And we'll have beautiful half redhead, half lonely, Fat pervert children. <laughs> Everybody make some noise for who y'all saw the scene. Oh my God. So many jokes about pussy in this book. Uh, white dudes, man, white dudes. <laughs> Shout out to Steve A.G. Yeah, yeah. Celebrities in this motherfucker, y'all. Okay, all right. This is called America's Crazy Neighbor, November 21st, 2006. Oh. <laughs> Michael Richards just made white America feel a lot better about their <laughs> ironic use of the N-word. He went up at the Laugh Factory, got heckled by two black guys, and he used the N-word, let's just say non-ironically. As in, you shouldn't be heckling me because you're a nigger. I'm paraphrasing, but that was the message. It's a yardstick the rest of us can use to be reassured that it's okay to sing, I'm a mustard loving nigger, I'm a mustard loving nigger. <laughs> <laughs> to ourselves while we make a sandwich on a Sunday <laughs> afternoon. <laughs> I know I'm feeling particularly non racist today. <laughs> Now, next time I see Brandon, I can say... <laughs> I, I can say, 
wow, how about that Michael Richards? <laughs> and we will roll our eyes together and embrace because of our mutual recognition of the real enemy. <laughs> that will make up for the chalkboard. Thank you, Michael Richards, you racist Christ figure, for bringing the rest of us together. <laughs> Wait, he's Jewish, right? See, this is the thing. I keep trying to explain this. Jews are racist. Genuine white people aren't. You have to look closer at the white race. There's a rainbow within it. <laughs> now, Italians and Jews are more racist than other whites because their blood is more mongrelized. You can tell by their noses and their hair. I'd have to say, if there's any form of white person that's the least racist, it's got to be the Germanic peoples. <laughs> we just have a natural gift for order. Let us help you wipe racism from the face of the planet. We will tell you which people are racist and which aren't, and we will separate them, and we will, well, well, look, I don't have to tell you what we'll do. You can have my car. I'm flashing back to an argument I had with Brandon on a set about six months ago. He and Wyatt Cenac were talking about Chappelle's black man in a dress theory, the theory that Caucasoid <laughs> entertainment industry and or audiences encourage male black comics to do gags that emasculate them. I remember losing my cool a little because I hate that theory. I hate being involuntary lumped in with anything because of the color of my skin. <laughs> but I really can't defend white people anymore, especially after seeing Borat. I'm just a full-blown, <laughs> self-loathing white person now, and I hate this cursed, racist, racist blood in my beautiful Aryan veins. <laughs> you know, I'm not that white. I have a lot of Polish blood, and the, <laughs> and the Poles are a downtrodden people. I mean, I'm practically black. <laughs> Let me be black with you. <laughs> There's nothing to whiteness anymore. It's a sinking ship, and I, I don't want to go down with it. I want to curl up in front of a fireplace with my beautiful black wife <laughs> and listen to jazz on some kind of black people's furniture, like some kind of bean bag or a chair shaped like a fist. <laughs> I want to rub her bare chocolate shoulders and kiss the nape of her slender Nubian neck and say, baby, you know what you do to me? And when I say it, I want to sound like a 70s DJ. I don't want to sound like there's something jammed up my pale potato-shaped nose. I don't want to sound like Doogie Howser. I want to sound like the deep clap of the African desert thunder. I want to sound like Barack Obama. And then when I take my elegant queen into our bedroom, which will be tastefully furnished with expensive items brought from local black merchants. <laughs> because we keep our money black. And when I remove my clothing, I don't want to look like a 200 pound baby ostrich. I want to look like Panthro from the Thundercats. <laughs> I want to lay this woman down. I want to lay her down until the break of dawn. And in the morning, I want to walk her to the kitchen naked, dragging my giant cock across the floor like a fire hose. And I want to make that bitch, which you would never be able to say to a black man. I want to make that bitch a beautiful omelet filled with black people's ingredients. <laughs> oh shit, I'm, I'm late for work. Uh, snap out of it, Harmon. It's a pipe dream. By the way, please note that if any white people leave comments under this why they, when they try to help me out with my bit, I'm not responsible for their lack of craftsmanship. <laughs> Do 
Do you want your ex to date a fireman, a ninja, or a mumbly drip? <laughs> April 8th, 2008, it's on page 196. <laughs> Which are you supposed to want more? Someone you dated ending up with a guy you think is more awesome than you, or less awesome? In a vacuum, I would think less awesome. Because then you could be like, she traded down. But that means she has bad taste, or that she herself sucks. And you loved her, and that's bad. I guess the ideal, and the thing that happens to me more often than not, is my ex ends up with someone that is a similar physical and or personality type to me. And it's weird that that's better. <laughs> there doesn't seem to be any logic to these feelings. But I feel most comfortable, I think, breaking up with a girl and then hearing that she's dating Dan Herman too, or as I call him, Ewan McGregor. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> Just kidding. Fred Belford. <laughs> okay, okay. Okay, Patton Oswalt. <laughs> Maybe the thing that's comfortable about that is the continued security that you did know this partner intimately. You were with them. And that's them over there now, and they're not with you, and you're you, and she loved you, and you loved her, and it didn't work, and she's doing something you understand. She wasn't crazy, and she wasn't hiding or suppressing some vital piece of information about what it is they really wanted. And I guess for that reason, it's also comfortable to break up with someone and then hear that they're with douchey, fratty banker guy. Because, first of all, those guys are always good for an honest handshake and a... Right on, bruh. Nice to meet my girlfriend's ex. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> second of all, you can just write them off as generic or even idealized men. And your girl ending up with one doesn't surprise you. It doesn't catch you off guard or raise all kind of alarming and embarrassing questions. It just means she finished eating a plate of spaghetti and now she's having a corn dog. <laughs> it is what it is. I have had exes that have ended up with my friends. <laughs> I have had exes that have ended up with my enemies. I have had exes that have ended up with people I have to look at on TV. I have had exes that have turned out to be lesbians. I have had exes that have ended up with guys that have made me think, oh, Jesus, she really peaked with me. <laughs> I uh, have had, had exes that have ended up with guys that have made me think, yikes, she was really slumming it with me. <laughs> I have had exes that have ended up with guys that have made me think, poor thing, I bet she misses laughing out loud. <laughs> 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 Oh, she finally found the right guy. She deserves better. Should have treated her better, etc. I even had an ex that killed herself, which is like breaking up with someone then hearing that they're sleeping with God. <laughs> <laughs> and all of these things, in their own way, seemed natural, accessible, something I could file. I've only had one girlfriend who broke up with me and then started dating a guy that made me feel... I think that is the most difficult scenario because it's called being insecure. Feeling vulnerable, confused, unsure about yourself. This girl is someone you shared your mind and body with. Their choices, previous and subsequent, in some way relate to you. They don't have to make predictable Sesame Street sense, but there should be some kind of cosmic internal logic. Your girlfriend shouldn't tip her hat to you, then turn and walk away and become a pterodactyl or an ear of corn <laughs> in a puff of smoke. And if she does, what does it mean about me? I'm the important one here. The thing I fear it means about me is that I'm incapable of falling in love with anyone. It's a horrible phrase to include in your blog, but it's time to say it. Maybe I've never been in love before. <laughs> It's either, that. <laughs> it's either that or I've been in love 800 times and it's about as hard to come and go as styrofoam peanuts. Hard to come and go, making up a new language. <laughs> I've been awake for two days straight, chasing a sitcom deadline, using performance enhancing drugs. The MySpace letters are actually waving like they're underwater. No exaggeration, that's how long my eyes have been open. <laughs>
Uh, Jim Rash, I'm reading uh, on page 93. I talk about you in this blog entry, April 12, 2008. Later on in this blog entry, I talk about you, but first some chit chat. In my previous entry, I said, if you live in Los Angeles, the weather was beautiful today. What am I? An immigrant practicing conversation? What's the unspoken remainder of that insight? If you don't live in Los Angeles, I have a hat. If you live in Quebec, there is a library. I apologize for that. It was out of line. The weather was beautiful yesterday, regardless of where you live. I try to keep the comments of my MySpace blog concise, polite, accessible, soup, and faggot. <laughs> it's, not that, it's not that I step out of bounds, but when I do, I account for it. I apologize. I am sorry that I said, if you live in Los Angeles, the weather was beautiful today. You don't need to know that kind of bullshit. This blog isn't written by your fat daughter. I don't get that kind of latitude. Okay. I slip up, pow, you pull the plug, you stop reading. Alternate suggestions for the sound of someone pulling the plug. Plute, clute, pull up, bloop, unplute. New paragraph. Still not talking about you yet. Maybe I'll talk about you later. Maybe the last sentence will be, you're a bad person. Drop like a fizzuckin' bizom after 11 pages of improvi uh, improvised onomatopoeia and stream of consciousness, what the French call les conchonis all stream. <laughs> all right, enough. All right. I don't speak French. All right, enough. Let's, oh, yeah. All right, enough. Let's talk about you, psych. You know what? <laughs> Maybe I will never talk about you again. Maybe I will not talk about you for six months, but then talk about you for 20 pages. Would you like a schedule of when I'll be talking about you? Well, wouldn't that be convenient? Given the amount of text I write that you have to scan and the time, you'd say not having to scan it, you could take up tennis. Get some shopping done. Work on that thing you do that only you do that I may or may not be referring to right now. Well, it just doesn't work that way, you fuck. Welcome to Hostingence. Don't look it up. I'll tell you, it's the state of being held hostage. Wait, hold it, stop. Do not use that word today. I made it up. I almost made you look stupid in front of your friends today. Speaking of friends, ah, uh, ah, uh, am I going to talk about you? <laughs> No, new paragraph, nothing to do with you. hey -oh! I'm not talking about you. I'm not talking about you yet, but I'm talking to you. Just you. You know who you are. You know I'm only pretending this is generic. You know I'm looking directly at you and you alone. And there is something I need to say to you and that I would only want to say if I was talking to you. I shouldn't have this kind of control over your life. <laughs> you should be floating through space and have Newtonian interactions based on your gravity, your mass, your momentum. I shouldn't be affecting you. I think you should stop reading. I promise, if you stop reading right now, I will stop writing. Ugh, okay, we both broke that deal. Another paragraph. <laughs> What's this going to be about? Is this going to be more bullshit about how sad, lonely, and scared I am? You don't have time for this shit. If I'm going to say nothing of any importance to you, the least I could do is keep it short. If I'm going to talk about you, can I just get to it? You don't have all day. You have a conversation scheduled immediately after this to talk about me talking about you. <laughs> I feel bad. I feel bad about this enormous amount of self-expression. I can't imagine how angry you must be when you pull up to it in your empty pickup truck and see how many meaningless chunks of me you'll have to toss over your shoulder before you find anything that reflects enough of your special face. Well, here, let me give you a break. Here's a shiny gem about you. I think you're stupid, selfish, and untalented. Here, let me help you load that into your truck, you vacuous piece of shit. We'll strap it with some bungee. Actually, why don't I ride with you so I can help you get this over to your identity pile? It can, uh, it can be pretty heavy to realize that I perceive you as a, whim, a whiny, empty, self-important bore. Is this your pile here? Oh, wow. Wow, impressive. Man, you sure have a lot of stuff from other people on here. No, oh, uh, you, sorry. Man, you sure have a lot of stuff from other people on here. No, no, that's not a judgment. Although I suppose if it was, it would go right on that pile. Okay, let's just get this big mother off your truck. Man, I really let you have it with this one, you parasite. This is bigger than anything you've already got. Now, 
I'm required to say this to everyone, uh, just as formality. You do realize, of course, that this giant jewel you got from Mount Harmon, while inspired by you and reflective of you, is not you. And that its value as a piece of expression is not value that can be directly attributed to you, but is, in fact, the direct result of Dan Harmon's tendency to make things interesting. Okay. <laughs> I know it's obvious, but I'm required to tell people that. You know, as long as I'm here, Mind if I take a look at who you really are? I wouldn't, I wouldn't mind getting underneath a lot of this stuff. Let's sort of, can we do a little experiment here? Um, we can put everything, we can put everything back uh, the way we found it as soon as I'm done. I just want to try something. Can we please remove everything from your identity that is the result of someone else saying something about you? Let's say, whoa, whoa, whoa easy. I'm not doing anything permanent. We're going to put it all back. You're going to be who you were before I came here. I just want to show you something. Let's just make a separate pile for all these rumors people have spread about you and compliments and insults people have dealt you and these horoscopes and oh, personality quizzes don't count as self-expression. People are always surprised to find that out. Applause, booze, your mother said a bunch of bullshit that cuts both ways, but none of it matters. Your accountant says you're attentive, your roommate, roommate says you're a slob, someone said you were a genius. Here's some photographs. Those are of you, but they aren't you. Here's a clipping from a publication, not you. And of course, this giant sparkling jewel I created when I called you human garbage, not you. Next, let's set aside all these things you like. Yes, the things we like are there because of who we are. But we're trying to get to the who we are part and not the BBC America, Sunsets, Baby Elephants, and Converse. OK, if we did this right. What we should have left is the stuff you generated, including anything you've expressed about yourself that hasn't been propaganda, sabotage, or lies. And we call that your actual identity. Well now, don't be ashamed. Just because it's not a giant pile of stuff doesn't mean you're not a person. It's exactly fears like that that lead, people over, uh, lead to people overpiling other people's stuff. You have plenty here, and your pile is cleaner. It makes it easier to make it bigger. What we do, uh, what do we, what do we got here? You're a chocoholic? I'm sorry, that shouldn't be in here. That's just saying you like chocolate. You can't put a holic after something you consume and call that an identity. Aw, aw, what's this little doodad? Did you make this? See, there we go, you make stuff. Everybody makes something. Let me check it out. I won't break it, I'm very familiar with these. This is called an attention sucker. <laughs> It's designed to draw attention toward an identity pile. These are cool. Can I, can I show you something? I, actually, uh, I have to actually open this. It's okay. Take it easy. I make these things all the time. I know them inside and out. A lot of people hate these things because they draw attention to identity piles that have nothing in them but more attention suckers. But inside every single one of these lame-ass, embarrassing, derivative pieces of shit that we make is something incredible. Look there, see that? It's right there at the center. This, there's a little baby expression. See how pretty? This expression contains something called need. And even though no two expressions of need are the same, the need they express is universal and eternal. So much so that you normally can't even see it, unless it's expressed inside one of these little gems. Isn't that pretty? Look at that need. Look how insanely incomplete and alone you are. It's infinite. You were born in need, you will die in it. Some people think that uh, not only does uh, need connect all people and all life, but that life is itself an expression of need <coughs> on the part of a physical universe, and that the physical universe is an expression of need on the part of the nothingness it's trying to fill. And some people actually believe that that's what God is, the original, infinite, unknowable, unfillable need, a single thought that says, something that is not must now be. And these people, and, and that, and these people that believe these things, they say that they can atone with that God by expressing your own need, by simply figuring out what it is you want, being honest with yourself about it, and then expressing it in some way, in a conversation, a poem, a joke, a movie, a stained glass window, etc. And everything you touch grows, and everything you imagine becomes, and you get laid, and you make money, and your life is easy. And you never have to defend yourself because everyone that means you harm bursts into flames because you're doing God's work and he doesn't want you fucked with. Now, let's put this unintentional expression of need you made back into this dumb thing surrounding it wasted the world's time. And let's put that, pile, that back in your pile. 
and let's put all your bullshit back there, all your rehearsal, ambition, <coughs> misdirection, self-pity, melodrama, entitlement, restraint, privacy, and brazen, bold-faced lies. There. You're all back to your shitty self again. <laughs> With me saying you're shitty right on top like a star on a Christmas tree. <laughs> you are quite welcome. <laughs> I am a very happy dude with a perfect life. But the first time I get sick, I'm out. I'm killing myself. <laughs> I've made it this far without a single broken bone, allergy, or bee sting. I've had a couple of stitches and a cavity. And one time, I thought I had hemorrhoids. But it turned out that there was half a kidney bean stuck on the outer rim of my ass. <laughs> I was putting tux pads on the fucking thing for two days, and then one morning, I wiped extra hard and it came off. <laughs> my grandpa fought. My grandpa fought at Guadalcanal. It was one of the most hellish campaigns of the bloodiest war in the world. And he came back home, and he never said anything. He drove some trucks. He built some shit out of wood. And one day, when he was already old, he was welding the inside of a fuel tank and it blew up. And they took him to the hospital and he looked like Freddy Krueger and they took skin off his ass and they put it on his face. And he came home from the hospital and put a deck on my parents' house and built some birdhouses and mowed the lawn. <laughs> and later he smoked himself to death. And he died never saying a goddamn thing about Guadalcanal. Me? I had a fucking bean on my asshole, and you would have thought it was saving Private fucking Ryan. I bet, I bet I complained more about my phantom hemorrhoid than my grandpa complained about having to pretend to be dead so the Japanese didn't pay a net him. No, 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 you guys go to the Tori Amos concert without me. Find a new friend there. It's too late for me. I've got a hemorrhoid. And it wasn't even a real fucking hemorrhoid. Have I made that clear? You know, sometimes the beans don't get all the way turned into poop, you know? <laughs> and you can, see, you can see a little part of the bean or a peanut or some spinach in there. Well, <laughs> half a bean stayed on the rim of my asshole. <laughs> and somehow, I don't know, maybe because it was concave there or there was suction or something and it... It just, it just was there, and I tried wiping, and I was like, ooh, that burns, that hurts. <laughs> you know why it was burning? It was a fucking spicy bean. It was from some kind of southwestern chicken wrap or something. Look. <laughs> I can talk all day about this, but I'm not gonna. <laughs> it's embarrassing. <laughs> I thought I had a hemorrhoid, and I was pretty much ready to call, call it quits. That's my point. And one day, I'm going to have a real hemorrhoid. It Here's the thing. I don't want one. I don't want to get sick. I don't like doctors. I don't want to take pills for my heart. I don't want to have a special bag hanging out of my dick because my kidney's liver doesn't whatever. I don't want to have to give myself shots. I don't want to be like Goldblum in the second act of The Fly. <laughs> Shuffling around in a flannel shirt, oozing adhesive grease, and lecturing the world about puking on donuts while my ears fall off and my sexy girlfriend cries. <laughs> Guadal fucking canal, you know? This motherfucker. He wouldn't even talk about it. I can't order a pizza without complaining. I, I complain having to go to the grocery store to get quarters so that my cleaning lady can wash my shitty underwear. If I was in a war, I'd never shut the fuck up. I'd be crawling around on the White House steps. What have you done to me? My grandpa, my grandpa probably killed so many Japanese I wanted to apologize when I met Ryan Nagata's grandma. <laughs> I said, I said, nice to meet you, but I really wanted to say, I'm sorry, I feel awful. I have this, I have this feeling that my family had a negative impact on your dating life. <laughs> and the fucking women from my high school, they're all married. No, I'm sorry, they were all married at my 10-year reunion. Now, they're just straight up old ladies, like sewing shit, like Bridge Club. 
We're exactly the same age, and we both have MySpace accounts, but they're photos of their but they're photos of their daughters on prom night, and I'm trying to figure out how to fuck them. <laughs> I'm a child. The women I took to see Die Hard in the theater now have children. <laughs> you want to know how old those children are? Some of them are clearly so old that if I met them, I would ask them if they had any pot. <laughs> and while we were smoking it, I would say, you know, when I was your age, I took your mother to see Die Hard. <laughs> Wait a minute. Die Hard. That was 20 years ago, and Bruce Willis still looks great. Did you see him in Live Free or Die Hard? He looks great. I'll be fine. I just need to do some sit-ups. On this very day, in 1973, a depressed 25-year-old girl was taking the ornaments off a Christmas tree when her uterus contracted and the man Time Magazine would call Fired by Sarah Silverman. <laughs> started sliding out of her vagina. It was a birth that would pay off for that 25-year-old girl in ways that none of her planned pregnancies ever did. I imagine a single tear running down her unconscious cheek while the doctors appraised her newest baby for symptoms, <laughs> for symptoms of her previous child's degenerative mental, con mental condition. I picture my young father giving a sigh of relief while being told that this one, that this one probably wouldn't be retarded, perhaps smiling as he hung up the phone and got back to work. I'm sure it was a busy day at the office, but I like to think he found time to slip off to the men's room, look himself in the mirror and think, now I have three children. <laughs> my mom always calls to ask what I want for my birthday, which she has always been careful to separate from the other seasonal holidays in a futile attempt to <laughs> circumvent my Christ complex. <laughs> I always tell her, Mom, you already gave me the greatest gift that can be given. You raised me in a family so dysfunctional that my blunt, mediocre talents adopted the illusion of a slight edge and allowed me to make money without working very hard. <laughs> There's also that gift of life thing, too. But judging from the date of my birth, I'm guessing the thank you card for that goes to the Supreme Court. <laughs> Can you imagine a world without me? And can you imagine a decision of that magnitude left to a woman? <laughs> you girls wonder how a man can be misogynist. Don't you see? Every man trying to control you started life as a bag of jelly in a woman's stomach. Ruling the world is our compensation for the fact that you rule our lives. I was at my best then. Drug free, no bad scripts, spine like rubber. All potential, no failure, universally lovable. And yet, if it weren't for the all-male government of my prenatal era, some crazy bitch could have killed me in my sleep. <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> I'm pro-choice. <laughs> because although I was unplanned, and although I've had a perfect life, my favorite parts of that perfect life have been the parts during which I was asleep. You know what an abortion is? It's letting a young writer get some sleep. <laughs> Don't let some Republican tell you what a fetus wants. I am as close as you'll ever get to a conversation with a fetus. <laughs> On behalf of all of us, we don't want to live. <laughs> we want pussy and sleep. <laughs> Give me that for my birthday. <laughs> Also, don't forget to tell me that I have a doctor's appointment on Monday at 10.15. <laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> Holy shit. <laughs> oh, God. Seth Morris. It said on the invitation. <laughs> Dan Harmon. Oh, uh, really? Or, Dark. yeah. <laughs> okay. Or Ladies and gentlemen. Or so we're just dressed like 
What? What's that? Excuse me? <laughs> Let me talk into the mic that doesn't do anything. <laughs> Yeah, ladies and gentlemen, my name is Rob Schraub, and I, I've known Dan probably longer than anyone here. Right, Chris? Yeah. Right, Chris? Yes, Rob. <laughs> From page uh, 227, proof that God is a development executive. <laughs> From January 14th, 2007. Earth, gay title, hard to spell. <laughs> Demands faith, demonstrates none, cannot be fired by anyone you're able to reach, but may stop existing if ignored, which explains all the noise and destruction. <laughs> Earth, originally much smaller and hotter, ended up ten times bigger and watered down. <laughs> Yahweh? Jew alert. <laughs> Demands weekly meetings, never shows up. Keeps other projects separate so nobody can compare notes. <laughs> Claims to have created Earth in six days, backs everything with that credit. <laughs> In reality, Earth assembled itself and took a billion times longer to do so because fuckface had to sign off on everything. <laughs> Supposedly liberal, owned by conservatives, lives in a giant house and jerks off to murder while someone else raises his children. <laughs> Doesn't use any of his powers to do any good for anyone, period. <laughs> Thank you. Now, reading his story, A Letter from the Future, this is the author of You'll Be Perfect When You're Dead, ladies and gentlemen, Dan Aaron, I, 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 I don't, I, I, I don't understand why someone could understand someone's narcissism this well. <laughs> and then not choose to fix it. And choose to just, like, celebrate it. <laughs> um, I, 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 if, if, I, if, I, if I was this in tune with what made someone a bad person, I would, I would try to recondition them. <laughs> um, and uh, I, I have a girlfriend who just loves me. But also, like, coordinated all you guys. I, I don't know. I... Um, uh, uh, thank you, <laughs> thank you for showing up. Thank you for I, I, I it's 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 a, I, I, I w w when I walked in the door, I, 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 the metaphor is that in the bathtub, if you pull the plug on the drain, if the bathtub's full, you 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 don't you you can't you don't know where the uh, thing is happening, like where the most dynamic, yeah. <laughs> like if the bathtub was only a little bit full, as soon as you pulled the drain, you go like, oh, that's where, like there's a funnel I could go, hey, Jackie, hey, Steve, thanks for coming, oh, this is great. I, I, I'm totally overwhelmed. The bathtub is so full that I can't isolate why I'm happy. I don't. That I, I'm in a room full of people that are way too tolerant of me, and um, I, I, I can't wait to just drink with you and have a good time and thank you so much for coming and, 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 and thank you Aaron for doing this and it's too much. It's too much. Rap! Thank you Abed for indirectly causing the destruction of my home. It's, it's the least I owe you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> and also a lot of that stuff I, well, I also wanted to express but, but like, like well <laughs> like, like 
I don't. I, I don't. I don't even understand. Like, like I, I don't. I don't remember any of this stuff. But I, like, I hear the headlines and I go, uh, "Oh shit, that's when Stacy dumped me." Like, like, I, there's that, like, like random events. So it's like that. I hear the headline and go, "Oh yeah, I was out to get somebody." I was trying. It was. It's, it was such a wasteful expenditure of energy. <laughs> Like, obviously, this guy, who is so much more talented than I am, in 2005, like, should have had his mind on better things than hurting a girl. Um, so take that lesson away from you, because I, I heard some really articulate weird shit that I'm not capable of anymore. Like, I, I, I have Chevy Chased into... Like, like, tapioca pudding, and I got... I, and I'll have a great career because that's what's that's what's paying out there. But 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 what I heard tonight was like sharp good shit, and it was by a guy who was in pain and who just wanted to hurt someone else. And uh, if if that guy had wanted to make people happy, it might have been even better. Okay, uh, so here's how we end it: uh, a letter from the future, December eighteenth, two thousand six. Dear Dan. Merry Christmas. It's me, Dan. <laughs> I'm writing you this letter from December 18th, 2006. That's right. It's ten years later, and you're still alive. I guess I should go in order of importance. You don't marry Allison. <laughs> or your next five girlfriends. <laughs> A movie you sort of write gets nominated for a Golden Globe. Your weight fluctuates between 185 and 230. In 2001, Islamic fundamentalists fly two passenger jets into the towers of the World Trade Center. And you buy this amazing coffee table. <laughs> Next paragraph. You find it at Ikea. <laughs> it's genius. <laughs> <laughs> it has a giant glass top and then underneath that there's a whole secondary surface it's like an auxiliary coffee table visible through the top layer when company comes over you can just move things from layer one to layer two and it becomes like a museum exhibit it's great people tell you it's too big and they complain when they smash their knees and it's sharp transparent corners they're jealous because they covet its place in your heart. <laughs> Unlike the coffee table, the terrorist attack isn't such a huge part of your life. <laughs> People just sort of jump on the rubble and sell it to each other in differently shaped packages, depending on whatever they were being, whatever they were doing beforehand. The Republicans use it to justify being gross. The Democrats use it to pretend they're not Republicans. The Oliver Stone movie is greenlit before they're done counting the corpses. The human life gets a little cheaper. Speech, gas, and health get a little less free. None of it affects you very much. For all I know, you profit from it. If my calculations are correct, you are a comic book writer. <laughs> and you sleep on a bare, cum-stained mattress in an unfurnished bedroom in Koreatown, surrounded by issues of Club International. You spend your nights smoking cigarettes, drinking Budweiser, and lurking in internet chat rooms. You're trying to finish a spec script about giant ants. You're wondering how long you can last before you have to go back to Milwaukee. Mm. <laughs> mm. <laughs> <laughs> Directly between us in 2001 is this line. On your side of it, Although you won't admit it, you think you're Christ. Half man, half God, here to save the world with your work. It's that assumption that makes it so difficult for you to get anything done. On the other side, you're just a man, and the world's not worth saving. You work when you're hungry, like a spider spins a web. And at the risk of implying that we're good, your stuff gets better at that point. I don't think that you were put here on earth to do things, you seem to accomplish more through laziness and selfishness than you ever have through hard work. For instance, having never broken a real sweat over the last 10 years, I'm nevertheless writing to you from your office on a small studio lot. There's a cast and crew down the hall, 
taping a promotional video for a new sketch show you're running. Your own show. Your dream show. All the people working on it are people who were drawn to you and Rob by similar ambitions, philosophies, and talents. By following your own satisfaction, somewhere along the way, you've created a little Camelot, a round table of autonomous geniuses, better people than you, good people, happy people, honest people. If that's family, it's, I'm sorry, it's that family, that kingdom, that I'm positive is your only decent accomplishment, more so than anything you'll ever write. That's why I wrote to you, not to tell you to change anything about the way you do things, but just to tell you to take it easy. Nothing you do matters as much as you think. Your greatest achievements aren't yours at all. They're accidents and jokes. You're a puppet. The universe does the work, and it gets the most done when you're moving the least. Surrender, flow, Relax. Don't be hard on yourself. Don't put pressure on yourself. Life is just a chain of experiments and results, and you'll be perfect when you're dead. <laughs> Over the next 10 years, there are women you hurt, and there are women who hurt you. There are times when you're a sexy genius, and there are times <laughs> when you're an ugly idiot. <laughs> times when you're broke, times when you're rich. It's never up to you and it has no correlation with your happiness. Best years of your life are spent in abject poverty. It's up, it's up and it's down, but overall, ever so gradually, it's up. Your life is never in any danger. You just sort of slip between raindrops and coast on what you're given, and everyone that has a problem with you tends to burst into flames. <laughs> I'm actually convinced now more than ever that your life is not real that you lived once on earth that's some very brave, unfortunate, hard-working man, and that you're living now in that man's afterlife, a reward for his time served. <laughs> you spend most of it laughing, surrounded by friends, being thanked, praised, and envied. The only way I could ever justify it karmically would be to assume there's something horrible in store for us, or to assume we've done something wonderful we don't remember. You're wondering what, it, what is this thing that happens in 2001 that changes our outlook so much. You want to know if it's the coffee table or the planes hitting the towers. <laughs> <laughs> I guess more the latter than the former. So maybe I was lying when I said it didn't affect you. There is, was this one night after the towers fell when you and Jeff Davis are driving down Franklin Avenue and the streets are lined with college kids holding candles, waving flags, and shouting, USA, like they're at a hockey game. <laughs> it makes you hate your country and your species. It pushes you over a threshold, forces you in pursuit of logic to take your hands off the wheel. These are not your people. You have nothing in common with them. There's a night when you bolt upright in bed and you can't breathe and you're so angry and confused. You're shouting. The government has failed. Those poor people in their cubicles looking at their Dilbert cartoons, suddenly being murdered by strangers, praying, paying the price for goods someone else received. Where is their apology? Why aren't we changing anything, etc.? Your girlfriend tells you to go back to sleep, and you do. And when you wake up, everything is fine. And you dare to ask yourself, what would I do if I found a million dollars? The answer isn't that you'd buy a million dollar typewriter. You'd get a house with a fireplace and you'd sit down and have a glass of scotch. It's at that moment when you realize your job is just a job that you start doing it again and doing it decently. So like I said, just relax. These things just happen. Your life unfolds. It's not a maze where you turn left or right. It's just a little ride where you're buckled in and then it's over. Anyways, it's that time of year, time to be nice to the strangers and friends we like. You were the first person off the top of my head in both categories. I admire and respect you. Just kidding. I do like you, though. You're my kind of guy. Merry Christmas, Dan Harmon. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.